So I have decided to follow Jesus. Um, I am going to, at the end of last week, we kind of ended on a nice little cliffhanger of my view of the intermediate state. And so I started this week kind of working on that. I'm not ready to teach it. But I am going to devote probably at least an entire class to that. Um, after we finish the problem passages, I'll probably slide it right in there. Okay? Um, so you just have to wait a couple more weeks. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to be looking at John 14. One of the things we've been looking at is the problem passages or the, the passages that are brought up in opposition to the new heaven and new earth um, or renewed creation text. And uh, let's just read, somebody read the first three verses um, and then tell me why, with all that we've been discussing, one, why this is a problem passage, and two, I'd like to hear from you guys why maybe from all that we've talked about, why it's probably maybe not a problem passage. So someone go ahead and read the first three verses. And if you read, you don't have to make the comment, so just don't scare you away from reading. All right, so first, why does this present a problem for the new heavens, new earth? Okay. All right, so where I go, one second. I will take you. Okay, so one, Father's house. Obviously, who are we talking about? God. Okay, so we're talking about God. And so normally, obviously, where God is, right? So Jesus saying he's leaving, he's going to where God is, right? And one day he's going to come back. And he's going to take them where I am, you may be also. So, in our minds, it ultimately jumps us to what event? All right, so ultimately, this a lot of times looks at, we're going to call it the second coming. Okay? Because obviously Jesus is going to come again, and he is going to prepare a place. Right? That's heaven. And a lot of times we, we kind of consider, there's a lot of people, like the KJV says what? What, is, what do they say? There's many what there? Mansions. Right? Like he's building everybody an individual house. Right? Everybody's going to get their own kind of mansion up there. Right? And so when, when he takes us back, we're all just going to kind of get our, get our place in heaven. Okay? So that's, that's the context, is seemingly of what Jesus is talking about. So, Father's house, anyone else have anything? Any other reasons why there's some verbiage in here that may either seem to go with or against what we've been discussing? Huh? It's not here. So, whatever he's talking about, right? He's leaving. Okay? So he's talking about a place that is not where he currently is. So if it's second coming, we're looking at heaven and earth, essentially. Okay? All right. Somebody read. Let's, that's, that's essentially one of the reasons why um, there are... Let me hand these out, and I'll tell you guys where we are on the, the actual note sheet here. Yes, sir. Proceed. Yeah, you ma'am. <clears throat> if you're in the notes, 
We are, we are on page, I probably should put page numbers on these, but page one, two, and on the third page, about halfway down, where it says John 14, one through three. Everybody see that? Third page, halfway down. And we're going to get right to the bold lettering almost at the bottom that says looking at the passage context. Okay? And I'm going to jump around in there, but I want to start with somebody read John 13, 36 through 38. These are the passages right before. What do you, if you're trying to get a context... Right? What's, what's the best thing to do? Read the passages before and after, right? Read the surrounding context. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. Jesus said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow to you. Okay. Does this bring up, um, maybe help us with the context of Jesus going away and coming? Think about it. Oh, yeah. All right. I want you guys to read that passage and figure out what's going on. All right. I didn't know who else to go to. You want what on there? Just the screens out in the hallway so we can watch what's going on. All right. All right. All right. Dipper. Yeah, I'm going to switch it right now. Go in and point this at the camera if you want to see in there. Okay. Oh, in there? Yeah. Point it at the camera up above. Okay. And you'll turn it on out there. Welcome. All right, what's going on? <clears throat> what is what is Jesus telling Peter? Key word is not now. Okay. Key, not now, but you will follow me afterward. So Jesus is saying I'm going away. Peter's saying, I want to follow you. He's saying, you can't right now, but you will. Once again, two options. Either we're discussing second coming, or, or there is a mission, right? Jesus wants to, Peter wants to follow Jesus. Jesus is saying, you can't right now, but you will be able to. So we're either talking about second coming or something else. Okay? So let's, I'm going to read John 14. We're going to kind of get into some of this context, okay? And I think it's going to help us understand what these dwelling places is, what's the Father house. I'm going to read John 14, and I'm going to read all the way to 24, okay? All right, so let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house 
are many rooms. Okay, Be before you even get into heaven, well, that's a funny way to say that. Before we talk about heaven, if I were to tell you that I am in God's house, what would you think? Heaven. <laughs> huh? Okay, so everywhere else, right? What, when, remember when Jesus is 12 years old? In the temple, what does he say? I'm in my father's house, father's business, right? We're looking at temple, okay? The church, the kingdom, okay? So there is another possibility, and this is the possibility that I strongly hold, and I'll tell you why. Watch. All right. So, in my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, I will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So, first, who is he talking to? Specifically, which disciples? The 13. The 12. Sorry. The apostles. Specifically, he is speaking, this is the night before his betrayal. He is telling them, I am going away, but I am preparing something for you. You can't follow me where I'm going now, but you will be able to follow me hereafter. Okay? Um, now, that's either into heaven, which is many, 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 hasn't happened yet, right? They're still waiting for the following after, or there's something else being talked about. Now, watch. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So now we're bringing to the Father's house, but also we're going to the Father. Just keep that in mind. All right? Jesus is the way to the Father. All right. <clears throat> If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, um, you do not know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am the father, and the father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe on account the works themselves. All right, we're going to skip down to verse 15, okay? If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. All right, so let's bring up this for a moment. Jesus saying, I'm sending who? The helper. the helper. And who is the helper in this context? All right. Now, what does the Spirit in the Father's house have in common? God. Gone, right? But if it's the temple, right, the Spirit is what makes up the temple, correct? So just, just keep all these connections. I know we're kind of like, where are you going, Jesse? But you'll see it. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So in the context, Jesus is speaking of a coming back to them, that he won't leave them as orphans as they are doing the mission that God is going to send them on. Okay, there's one of the reasons why this is also called the spirit of whom? The spirit of Christ. Because if the spirit is in us, who also is in us? Christ is in us. Okay, so just we're going to really take it home when we get to verse 24, but watch. I will not leave you as or yet a little while. The world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live you will also live. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandment and keeps them, he, is, he it is who loves me, 
and he who loves me will be loved my, by my father, I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not the Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not the world? Jesus answered him, and watch this. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him. We will come and make our, what does it say? Home. Home. Abode with or to dwell with him. Interestingly enough, this word is the same as this word. When Jesus says, I go to prepare a dwelling place for you, I am going to prepare. Remember, in our studies that we've been talking about, what is the ultimate goal that God has been in the relationship between God and humans, God is trying to dwell with whom? Us. Jesus saying, I am preparing a place in which God and man can dwell together. Now, he's talking not second coming, though. He's talking when he sends the Spirit, the Helper, and those who love him, I will not leave you as orphans, while you are living on this earth, my spirit will come and dwell with you. And if you have my spirit, you have me. And if you have me, you have the Father. And if all three of us are there, we come and make our home with you. This fits perfectly in the context of what we've been discussing with New Heavens, New Earth. He's not speaking about, if you keep reading the second coming, he's not going to send the spirit when they die and go to heaven, right? That's not when they receive the spirit. When the, the helper comes is not when they die and go to heaven. The helper was going to come in Acts chapter 2 when they set up what? The kingdom. And everybody in Acts chapter 2 who believed and was baptized, what did they receive? They received the Spirit. And guess what that's called? The household of whom? Of God. The church is the house, the temple, the dwelling place of God. What Jesus is saying, Peter, where I'm going, you can't follow because I'm the only one who can do what I'm about to do. And what he's about to do is go die on the cross. And in dying on the cross, remember Day of Atonement, we've been talking about that. What does his blood do? It purifies a place. In this context now, we're not purifying a temple. Who becomes the temple? When you receive the blood of Jesus... You become a temple, a vessel where God's Spirit can do what? Dwell in you, and therefore you become the house of God. Not for a moment do I think that Jesus is saying, I'm leaving you, your hearts are going to be troubled, but I will come again and I will, I will not leave you as an orphan, I will be with you. That he's saying, you're going to have to live this entire life without me. And one day when I come back at the second coming, that's when I will send the helper. That's when me and God will make our home with you. That's when all the promises, right? He's talking, he's preparing the church. He's preparing the kingdom. He's preparing a place where people can become Christians and have a relationship with God. Now, is that ultimately pointing us towards the final place where we can live with God forever? Obviously, right? That's, I mean, that's Old Testament dual fulfillment pro prophecy all over the place. God says there's a fulfillment, but there's always a greater fulfillment. So in John 14, the context demands that Jesus is speaking to his disciples, specifically his apostles. I'm going to die. I'll be gone for three days, but I will come back. Okay? And when I come back, what am I going to give you? I'm going to give you the Spirit, and those who love me and keep my commandments, we will be those people, including the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and all who love, we will be what? We will be the household of God. All right? But now look at verse 24. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things that I have said to bring you into remembrance. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. 
I do give to you, let, your not, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, but I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I've told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. Watch. He's telling them, when I go, you're not going to believe. But when I come again, you will believe. What happens when Jesus goes in the grave for three days? What does his disciples do? Luke 24 exemplifies this, the two men on the road to Emmaus. We thought he was the one, right? Go to John 24 with me. Sorry, not John 24, John 20. Look at verse 19. This is after Jesus' resurrection, and this is he already appeared to Mary Magdalene, right? And now he's going to come and appear before the apostles. And watch, watch how John 14 and John 20, 19 through following fit perfectly together. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, they were hiding, they were scared. Jesus had died. And in Matthew's account and Luke's account, they're trying to figure out what do we do? Now that he's dead, what are we to do? He's gone. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. What did he say in John 14 when I come to you? What will I bring? I'll bring peace. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to him again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. This is his coming back. This is his coming back to his disciples. I've gone to prepare the place. I've died. I ascended, or not ascended, but I was in the grave for three days. The Father sent me back to show me to you so your hearts may not be troubled anymore. And what is he about to do right now? He's about to prepare them to receive what? The Spirit. Okay? And watch how belief happens, right? And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. It's exactly what he promised in John chapter 14. What he would do, he did. It's not going to be something that happens at the second coming. The Father's house is the church, the kingdom, the temple, and they have been added into it. And then they are going to go do what? They're going to go preach that, and those who love God, those who keep his commandments, those who receive the Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit will come and make their home with them. Does that make sense? You see how the context doesn't seeming anywhere. <clears throat> the King James Version kind of hurt us there. Why? Because it says mansions. This word, dwelling place, is the Hebrew word betav. This Greek word is used in the Old Testament for the word betav. This was my very first Bible class here as my tryout sermon was the concept of Betov. And I remember Richard Paulus telling me, he goes, that was probably the worst Bible class you could have taught as a tryout class. <laughs> I just remember him saying that. Um, it, was, it was too much. But you know what this is? A Betov, a dwelling place, is, it's in the patriarchal age. It's if you are the top patriarch, you would go and prepare a place where people can, your family would have homes on this plot of land and you would be in control of it. And this is also where the kinsman redeemer aspect comes in. Because if one of your family, let's say you have a daughter or a granddaughter or a niece who's a part of your betav, they go out and marry someone else but lose their husband. What is your responsibility as the patriarch to bring them back into your dwelling place, to buy them back? That's the kinsman redeemer. Ruth and Boaz. Remember the story of Ruth and Boaz? Ruth's father dies, husband or father-in-law dies, husband dies, and um, Naomi tries to send Ruth back, and Ruth says no, but she's got to work the fields. Boaz sees her, and he wants to marry her. He wants to bring her into his Betav, and that's where the kinsman redeemer comes in. But there was somebody who was above him, had to give him chance first, right? He didn't take it, and Boaz brought him in. This is the concept. Jesus saying, I am going and preparing a place where I can be your redeemer. 
and I will bring you back into the presence of God, the thing in which you have lost. Okay? That's the Father's house. It's not heaven one day, right? It's going to be heaven on earth, because as we point to Revelation, Jesus did go a second time, right, at his ascension. And what does the angel tell the apostles when they see Jesus ascending back up to heaven? Don't you know that he will return in the same way that he came? And we looked at 1 Thessalonians 4 last week. How will he return? Trumpet, great shout, right? We will all be raised up, but we will meet him. And there's that parading back. And Revelation 21 says that the heavenly city, which has been prepared, will come and make its dwelling place among men. All right? I'm going to read one more spot, and then I want to kind of open up for questions or comments. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And I want you to see how Paul brings all this together in verse 13 all the way through following. Somebody read Ephesians 2, 13 through 22. If you read it, read it loud and proud like you're reading the Word of God. You see how Paul brings together the peace that Jesus brought with the Spirit and that we are all made the dwelling place of God. The Spirit is the joining force that makes us, right, the Father's house. Peter would go on to say in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we are all, what, individual stones in the household, the abode, the house of God, right? So to me... John 14 does not, in context, contradict the new heavens, new earth. If anything, it emphasizes the new heavens, new earth. It points us towards that similar goal, God wanting to make his dwelling among man, right? And he started that through the church, right, in his kingdom. Comments, questions, thoughts. Does it make sense? Can you see it? Carolyn? Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to get it all down in here so I can... Oh, yeah, I know. I skipped. I, there's a lot of information in here that I put in. There's a lot more verses. And I decided not to go through and read every bit of it. Um, one, because it's a lot. Right? Let's read, let's read one more place. I just want to kind of bring us into a, another, another aspect of this. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. One of the reasons why I love this section in Hebrews 12, it literally brings all of the images of the Old Testament of where God has dwelt, and it collides them all into the kingdom like every aspect of where God has dwelt and been, he's going to say, this is what we've obtained, okay, through the blood of Jesus. So in verse 18, he says, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, right? So fire, right? 
that is the first time in the Exodus story of how God leaves his people, right? He leads them by a cloud of fire, okay? Darkness and gloom and tempt us, the sound of a trumpet and the voice whose hurt words made the hearers beg that no further messages may be spoken. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, what, what are we referencing there? Right? The Ten Commandments, right? When God comes and dwells on Mount Sinai, God's dwelling place is there. They touch it, they die. We've come to the blazing fire. We've come to the mountain. Um, indeed, so terrifying that the sight, Moses said, I tremble with fear, but you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God. Remember when God says, I will put my name there in Jerusalem? That became the new mountain where God's presence is, the Jerusalem, right? And the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gatherings. So it even brings the heavenly, the heavenly picture of where God is. Every time you see God on a throne, what's surrounding him? Angels, right? So he's saying all of the images where you've seen God either on heaven or on earth, we have been brought to, and watch, and to the assembly, that's the word ecclesia. What does the word ecclesia mean? What do we call that? It's church. That's where we get the word church from, the called out gathering. So into the, your version may even say the church of the firstborn. Assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they do not escape, when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. That goes back to the Daniel 7 image. Remember where he's going to shake and all the kingdoms of the earth will be destroyed, but there will be one kingdom that remains. It'll be the kingdom of God. This phrase, yet once more, indicates that the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. So here's, here's the point. Why we need a new heavens and new earth is God is going to come, He's going to shake the earth. Other images, He's going to burn it on fire. He's going to consume it so that the only thing that is left is the kingdom of God, but it's going to be remade, right? Um, and that it will remain. It won't be destroyed. It's going to stay. Therefore, let us be grateful, receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let, it, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. That's so important because if you believe in the household of God that we will be in one day, that will affect your worship here. But if you believe that every time you come to worship God, you are in the very presence and the house and the throne of God, doesn't that change the way you worship? Or shouldn't it change the way you worship? The Hebrew author is saying, you've got to remember you're worshiping a consuming fire. Remember all those images of the flaming fire and the mountain and the fear that was had? In Jesus, we don't have fear. But if we're outside of Christ, there's fear to be had. Okay? So we've come to the household of God. All right. I told you every class we're going to finish off with Revelation 21. Let's go there. I'm going to finish every class like this because I need you guys to remember these things. <clears throat> and I'm going to start Revelation 20, verse 11, down through following. This is the great throne scene. So this is all the things accumulating together. Then I saw a great white throne and him who seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away. No place was found for them. Remember throughout the book of Revelation, there are people constantly hiding from God. Um, there's nowhere to hide from God. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by that which is written in the books according to what they had done. The sea gave up the dead. That's why, by the way, the sea in the Jewish mind 
is representative of where evil comes from, where chaos comes from. Because in the beginning, Genesis 1, darkness hovered over the face of the waters, and God from the waters created everything good, okay? But chaos is in the sea. They were f- afraid of the sea. That's why that's where all the, um, the, the evil comes from. Um, and that's where the dragon comes up later in Revelation uh, 10. Um, where was I? What verse was I in? All right, 13. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they have done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the lake of fire. There's the great shaking, by the way. There's the great shaking. Who's left after this great shaking? Those who are written in the book of life. Now, what is the image that we get next? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. No more evil. No more chaos. No more dragon coming out of the sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place, the abode of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And here's what I want to talk about. Even if you think John 14 is still speaking about the second coming, it still fits. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to bring you where I am. Well, guess where he's going? At the second coming, he's taking all the dead who were raised in Christ, right? All those who are in the city, and he's bringing them back down to be among men. And so I th- it still fits no matter where you go. Now watch. He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. To the thirsty I will give from them the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, murderers, sexual immorals, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. There it is. That's my answer to John chapter 14. If people say, well, what do you, what, Jesus says where I am, right? You can't go. But he was speaking in a context of going to the cross. Peter could not fulfill the mission that Jesus was fulfilling he says, but you will go one day. You will be a part. And we're at the end of John. What does the conversation that Jesus has with Peter at the end of John? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Now you're a part of it. Now you can go. I've sent you my spirit. You're a part of the household of God. You're going to be a pillar of the kingdom. Right? Matthew 18, he gave him what? He gave him the keys to unlock and open and bring people in. 